Today, as we begin Open Access Week here at UMass Amherst, it is my pleasure to introduce someone who has long participated in open access publishing, our provost, James Staros. Thanks, Jay. I'm delighted to uh, have an opportunity to open this uh, session today and this week of, uh, of activities. Uh, I have actually been a practitioner, uh, mostly with course materials. We were talking a, a few minutes ago about some of my early attempts in the early mid-90s of posting materials for classes in lieu of, uh, in lieu of uh, textbooks or lab manuals and things. An interactive lab manual we posted in January of 93. Uh, so that's fairly early to that process. Um, I think it's very important, uh, Jay talked about scholarship, I think it's very important to include uh, teaching materials in this discussion, uh, especially in this era when uh, the states are pulling back and public higher education is becoming less and less public and we're asking students and their families to take on more and more of a burden. Uh, the more material that we can uh, give to students, the more we can help balance that process of of uh, shifting of costs onto students and their families. Um, as a small trial experiment, uh, Jay and Marilyn Billings and I partnered last spring uh, with, a, with a trial run. We gave out 10 mini grants, micro grants, $1,000 a piece to convert materials that were already extant into online uh, available course materials, open access course materials. Uh, the initial estimate is that uh, the 10 courses that were so converted will save the students in those courses $70,000 this year in textbook costs. And of course, that's a recurring savings with just a little updating of those materials. So this is, uh, I think, this is the future. And um, without further ado, the future is now. <laughs> Thank you, Provost Staros. We're very fortunate indeed to have a provost who understands the issues that we as a community are talking about. Not, not all institutions are so fortunate. Today's keynote program is entitled Beyond the Copyright Wars, Fair Use, Free Speech, and Reframing the Policy Debate. Co-sponsors for this program today are the Center for Public Policy and Administration, the Department of Communication, the Science, Technology, and Society Initiative, the Students for Free Culture, UMass Amherst Chapter, and of course, the University Libraries. As our kickoff speaker for this year's UMass Open Access Week, we are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Patricia Ofterheide with us. Dr. Patricia Ofterheide is the director of the Center for Social Media and the University Professor in the School of Communication at American University in Washington, D.C. She heads the Fair Use and Free Speech Research Project at the Center in conjunction with Professor Peter Yazzie in America University's Washington College of Law. Dr. Afa Heidig is the co-author of Reclaiming Fair Use, How to Put Balance Back into Copyright, uh, co-authored with Peter Yazzie, that was just published in July of this year. She has also authored several other publications, among which are Documentary, A Very Short Introduction, The Planet, The Daily Planet, Communications Policy in the Public Interest, among others. Dr. Aftaheide received her PhD in history from the University of Minnesota. She's been a Fulbright and Guggenheim Fellow and has served as a jury, a juror at the Sundance Film Festival, among other things. That's probably one of the most exciting things. Uh, you know, what's a Guggenheim? What's a Ful Fulbright? You know? <laughs> Sundance, that's, that's something. So she has received numerous... That is someone who hasn't gone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That is true, that's no, true. Um, she's received numerous journalism and scholarly awards, including the Preservation and Scholarship Award in 2006 from the International Documentary Association, a Career Achievement Award in 2008. How can you receive a Career Achievement Award already? That's a, I love this 
<laughs> from the International Digital Media and Arts Association and the Woman of Vision Award from the Women in Film and Video in the year 2010. So please help me welcome Dr. Patricia Oftehada. Well, it is so exciting to be here. Uh, this, uh, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting with um, several groups of faculty members since I arrived yesterday afternoon. Uh, it's an incredibly impressive and collegial and interdisciplinary faculty. Um, and I have worked with some of you previously because we are working at my center along with the Association of Research Libraries on creating a code of best practices uh, in fair use for academic and research libraries about which I'm going to discuss more later, but um, this is an institution that has really taken a leadership role and will continue, I think, to be very important in this story. So today, uh, I'd like to talk about um, transcending a discourse about copyright that I think has been unhelpful to getting to the important place that this institution is today. Uh, I think we have a, a rhetoric that is uh, not helping anybody understand what's possible under copyright, which is a language of warfare. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a language that is um, surrounded by the, the large copyright holders' issues, which are not necessarily everybody else's. Their issues are that their business models are collapsing, um, that the structure of media industries in general is being profoundly reconfigured. This is a genuine problem. I teach in a school of communication. This is uh, a very, very critical issue uh, for many, many people. Uh, and we hope that we are not going to see something that looks like this. But we might. Uh, in an effort to um, protect themselves from change, in this business model, an understandable impulse. Large uh, corporate media stakeholders have played an extraordinarily important role in changing the legislative landscape around, fair, around copyright since 1976. The work that I do on fair use would have been irrelevant before then. It wouldn't have been important enough to really bother everybody with. Because before 1976, and well, well, before 1976, you, uh, you had a far more flexible copyright environment. After the rewrite, uh, which was really driven, uh, actually this, the, the precise story behind this is, is written about in, in the book that, that uh, was so kindly earlier mentioned, Reclaiming Fair Use. But that, when, that, when that copyright rewrite happened, um, we saw copyright term extension uh, to um, we saw, we saw an extension of derivative rights. We saw default copyright. Before that time, you had to, you had to apply for a copyright. You had to renew that copyright. Now, um, does anybody have uh, a child who's brought home a piece of paper from school that they did there, like a drawing or something? Anybody had that experience? OK, that copyright belongs to that child. Um, so everything, everything is copyrighted. Um, so the, the world, the landscape as we know it, really changed profoundly. And it has changed increasingly in an unbalanced way toward the interests of the limited monopoly holders in copyright since. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998 was another deep incursion into the rights of people who need to quote copyrighted material without permission or payment. Um, and among other things, it criminalized the de-encryption of material in order to access it even for legal uses. We saw more copyright extension in 1998. We saw terms of treaties to bring the United States and, the, and, the, and Europe in conformity that further uh, deepened the hold of copyright holders and made copyright even more unbalanced. On top of that, you have activities by large corporate stakeholders that um, have created um, an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. Among other things, um, the RIA had um, a set of lawsuits, which I'm sure uh, are, are familiar to you. They sued uh, ordinary users for downloading. Um, in the process of suing people for downloading, they also intimidated a lot of people who might want to use copyrighted material under fair use for totally legal reasons, um, because people get confused between downloading and, and reusing 
what else has happened is that cease and desist letters and now counter ta uh, takedown notices on YouTube have also preemptively told people they are infringing when it's very possible that they are not. So owner education has become a real problem because um, copyright holders have developed a whole set of copyright materials which profoundly discourage people from ever using any copyrighted material if they didn't license it. On the top, you'll see the, uh, the, the picture that comes from the uh, Business Software Association. You can, uh, it's an entire game you can play as a young person that will make sure that you are terrified of ever <laughs> using your rights. Um, the Copyright Alliance, I think uh, many people are familiar with the Copyright Alliance. It, is a, it, is a, uh, it, it creates a lot of materials that, uh, of course, it is a uh, lobbying arm of the large media corporations. Uh, I want to point out the rhetoric that people use in the copyright holder um, world in order to describe unbalanced copyright as appropriate. Um, they say, look, this isn't a limited monopoly, right? This is property. You take this stuff for whatever purpose, you're stealing. And who steals? What kind of a person steals? Would you steal a car? No? Then why are you downloading? Now, that is not to say I approve of downloading, in spite of the fact that it's rare to find somebody under 70 who doesn't. But um, it's... Um, the language here is any use of copy, people's copyrighted material, any use is stealing and it's immoral. It's a bad thing to do, bad people do it. Um, do you want to use your fair use rights? Do you, want to, do you want to use copyrighted material without permission or payment? Well, that's getting away with something and you, should, you might be able to do it and you know you might get away with it. It would be wrong, but you might. Uh, and then the thing that, that's, that's what you tell a young person. What do you say to the legislator? Uh, what do you say to the adults? Well, you say, we are producing one of the United States' most valuable exports, and the greater part of our profits and of your returns are from international sales. You are going to cripple the future of the American economy if in any way you do not further unbalance copyrights by creating more uh, rights for limited uh, monopoly owners. And I'll give you some examples of this. Richard Parsons, who was head of uh, CEO Time Warner, he said, look, what will happen um, if, uh, if we allow you know, terms that, that allow people to access copyrighted material more fairly? Oh, well, artists will not create like, like you guys. You, you wouldn't do that. Um, it, you're, you're in it for the big bucks, I'm sure. Um, the country will end up in a sort of cultural dark ages. Um, so these are extreme scenarios that are painted with great uh, regularity. Uh, the late uh, Jack Valenti, within the glittering potential of the internet lies the deep, darker form of thieves capable of breaking and entering conventional barriers. To, this was for all language for the DM to pass the DMCA. To steal copyrighted material borne by the internet by just about anybody with a working computer. Jack Valenti's language was magnificent. He had a rhetorical ability that is really unmatched, um, and, and he constantly used a, a language of fear. Uh, so on the other side of this rhetorical divide, you, uh, from, from the, the, the copyright extremists, you then have the copy leftists, um, who are who? They're scholars. Um, they're activists, students for free culture. Uh, they're artists. And what's their rhetoric? Now I'm going to make some vast generalizations that do not apply to the good work that is being done in this library and this university. <laughs> but here's some very popular copyright, copyleft rhetoric. Copying is not stealing, copying is sharing. Good people share. Um, bad people hoard. <laughs> Owners are bad and corporations are especially bad. Um, Copyright really is all about protecting those owners who happen to be bad. Um, and so the future of culture, which is us and the good guys, is threatened by copyright. So copyright's the problem. So if copyright is the problem, if you cannot work with copyright, what will you do? Well, you can leave copyright. Leave the environment completely. You can spoof it, make fun of it, ridicule it, and you can protest it. 
So there are alternative worlds being developed within the copyleft environment. These are worlds that can be used successfully or can be used oppositionally. What I'm suggesting is that these tools really need to be used successfully uh, with an, a language of efficacy rather than a language of moralism. But nonetheless, these tools are all designed to create alternatives to the, to the copyright regime. The G GPL, the General Public License, is a software license that actually, um, it, like Creative Commons, it does a jujitsu approach to copyright. It says, well, we have really strong copyright. So we, using that strong copyright, copyright owners will go in and reduce the level of strength of their copyright because it's so strong and they can do that. Open educational resources, including Spark, Open Access, Open Courseware, are all attempts to free up copyright by entering into an alternative domain. And there are some really good examples of this, too. Pranksterism is a different approach. It says we're going to make fun of copyright. And there's some hilarious stuff here. Um, Cambrew McLeod is a genius at doing pranksterism. The Yes Men have done a lot on trademark. They don't do much on copyright. Um, now, um, and, there's, and there's protests, like Students for a Free Culture have done a lot of protests. Civil disobedience has been done by Downhill Battle, which downloaded, and I'll never, I can't figure this out, they downloaded um, Eyes on the Prize. Eyes on the Prize was being kept um, a, a, out of circul a circulation in home use because of its, um, because its licenses had expired. And um, so they, they decided to make a statement by making it available illegally for downloads. Um, but I have to say um, that it didn't do any good for the filmmakers who made that film. Um, and you can complain. You can sound the alarm. You can tell people that copyright is terrible. Um, illegal art was, a, um, was an exhibit that showcased the limits of copyright. And the weird thing about illegal art was that all the art in the exhibit was legal. Um, in fact, it was legal because it employed fair use. But they didn't say that. They said it was illegal because you want to sound the alarm about how bad copyright is. Bound by Law is actually a, a, a funny comic book and a great comic book. It was about to go to press when they asked us to take a look at it. And we said, you've made this sound like it's just impossible for a filmmaker to make a film. But actually, a film, filmmaker could use their fair use rights in order to make a film. How about that? And actually, filmmakers have written a code of best practices to do that. And they were like, oh, well, we'll try to get that in. And they did. They got it into three panels in the entire uh, comic book. So you see examples of people um, uh, s sounding the alarm to, to describe copyright as, as uh, unworkable. I love Cory Doctorow, but I don't love him when he says copyright turns us all into IP serfs. It just, to me, it's giving up too much territory to unbalanced copyright. Um, they say, look, you either are, you, you either are a, you, for yourself and you're hoarding your stuff, or you're part of a community. I personally don't think you need to pick. I think that you, there, you can, you can uh, take a look at what copyright offers and be able to um, uh, and also be a member of, uh, member of a community that can share. Uh, and then they say copyright just doesn't fit digital culture. It's made for an old regime, so the whole thing needs to be fixed. Um, this, and uh, there are some major spokespeople for the copy left. Larry Lessig has been very vocal. He's the person who famously said fair use is the right to hire a lawyer. If you know one phrase about fair use, it's probably Larry Lessig's. Um, his, his attitude is fair use is a distraction. It's a red herring. It's going to keep you working on the small stuff when what we need to work on, on is the big stuff. We need a truly free culture. Fair isn't good enough. Um, it's still going to be an unbalanced copyright law even when you're, um, even when you're um, using your rights. So I'm going to dramatize the problems. And I'm going to hope that, that I will make you scared enough about the future that you will want to um, take action by presumably joining alternative worlds or, or pranksterism. David Bollier, who's a local, um, a local figure and um, a big voice on the commons, has um, also contributed to an atmosphere in the copy left that is both moralizing and um, secessionist. He is arguing that what commoners need to create is a digital republic of their own, that, it's, um, that, that, um, that if we can just make that population big enough, 
we will overcome the problems of copyright. And so what are the reform proposals? Uh, the form, reform proposals have been, let's, let's make uh, con copyright policy unconstitutional because it's such a, uh, it's such a, because the government permits private censorship. Uh, and that was the Eldred case, which uh, Larry Lessig lost, and I would say put copyright reform back 30 years with that. Uh, the other possibility is to ask Congress to rewrite copyright law. I don't know if you were there for the first part of this presentation, but those very large stakeholders in the large media corporations have not gone away. To the extent that there's any copyright reform at this moment, even with, the, even with the input of companies like Google, Facebook, and Consumer Electronics Association, all of which are on the fair use side of the equation, those companies will be very important in rewriting copyright reform. I do not think that the artists, the scholars, um, uh, and the activists have the heft that the MPAA and the RIA do in those discussions with, and broadcasters do in those discussions with Congress. So uh, both of those proposals don't work out too well. But they, here's what's scary, is that a copyleft approach and a copyright approach shares a common rhetoric. And that rhetoric says, this is really about whether you're a good person or a bad person. You're either sharing or you're stealing. It says, um, copyright is all about the owner side of things. That's the bad, that is, that is the only significant part. Fair use, it's the right to hire a lawyer. That's all you can do. Uh, there's no goal to achieve any balance in copyright. So therefore, only legal reform can save us. Now, what happens? A copyright war rhetoric that pits the good little guys and the artists and the scholars against the bad big guys, the corporations, the vendors, it ends you up in a language which is, you know, been described as a moral panic, which is a crisis that is, is about something that deflects you from what the real issues are. And we don't, as we go forward in open access resources, we don't need to do that to ourselves. I don't know whether any of you have ever been to the High Line in New York, but this is actually a picture of the creation of the High Line, and it's meant to illustrate that there is a path out not sure that that is actually working as, an, as a metaphor. But I want to show that there's a way out in which we can get some of where we want to get to in a highly imperfect world with a highly imperfect copyright policy. And we can do it within our own lifetimes. And it would have to go back to the purpose of copyright. And if I, if I ask any of your students what is the purpose of copyright, I know exactly what they will tell me. What would they tell me? Protect the creator, that's the purpose of copyright, and that's what everybody knows. But in fact, the purpose is extremely well articulated within copyright policy and within the Copyright Act. The goal is to promote the creation of culture. It's not to stop the creation of culture. And so there are two big buckets of strategies in which copyright policy uh, promotes, foments the creation of culture. And one is to give a limited monopoly to creators, something that was highly debated, by the way, uh, at the founding of this country, and only was given to creators with, with a very, very short timeline because people were so worried about giving from the many to the few. But nonetheless, it's one of the, it's one of the perks, okay? If you make something, you'll have a limited monopoly over it. But the other bucket of strategies is to let people have access to existing culture because they need it to make new culture. And that's a really basic fact. Everybody here who does creative scholarly work knows that you can't really do it by yourself. In spite of everything they told us in grade school about not copying from each other, we actually do that all the time. We build on each other's work. And everything we know about the science of the mind n n assures us that we cannot have an independent and original thought all standing there by itself. It's always associated with something else. Uh, and so 
we can't build anything new in the culture without building on existing culture, either explicitly or implicitly. And obviously, the second reason why we care about balance in this country is because when the government enables private censors, the government itself is censoring, and that would violate the First Amendment. And if people who made stuff today get to censor any use of it, have a say over any use of it forever in the future, that would be censorship. OK, so we have a situation where we have unbalanced copyright. We have very privileged uh, copyright holders. We have a culture in, we have a culture that I'm looking at, a scholarly culture, a creative culture, an artistic culture that is genuinely hobbled. Not necessarily, and not in all circumstances, by copyright policy. Frequently by assumptions, miseducation, and hesitancy. And we have genuine confusion over what our rights are. So we do have a bunch of balancing rights. We have exemptions that all of us use in the classroom every day. We have th those are exemptions under one part of copyright law, 110. We have exemptions that the librarians use every day, 108. We have some exemptions for disabled people that, we, that affect us every day in 121. We also have other um, features of uh, reuse, such as first sale. You know, the guy gets to sell you the book, and then you get to resell it, unless you bought it on a Kindle. Um, and finally, and most importantly, fair use. Fair use has become, it didn't used to be, but it has become the big, fat, giant escape hatch from limited owner monopoly in a current situation where the, where the stuff has not fallen into the public domain and where the owner has not been kind enough to do something like Creative Commons. That would be a lot of people, by the way, including all the people who make all of our commercial media. Fair use, as I'm sure you know, is the legal and unauthorized use of copyrighted material under some circumstances. And the law is practically that clear. That's about what it says. So this is a law that, is, this is a doctrine that's extremely flexible, it's extremely broad, it's extremely adaptable. It is, um, let me go back here a second. It's deliberately vague, it's deliberately abstract, because what, the, what you are supposed to do with fair use is apply it to your particular circumstances. Now, how does, how does in the copyright war scenario, how do the extremes talk about this? Well, the copyright, I know what the copyright holders, the large media copyright holders say, because they write it down and they, and they distribute it in materials for uh, K-12 and higher ed education. They say fair use is a gray area, it's very dangerous, it's only, a, it's only a defense, it's very risky. They say it's only defense because the only time you actually apply your rights formally is when somebody challenges you. Fair use is a right that is exercised in defense like, like, like self-defense is a right. You only ever use self-defense as an actual right once somebody hit you and then you hit them back and then they said, no, he hit me first and I'm suing him. Then you say, I'm using, until then, the, the, the law doesn't need to come into place. So that's what, co that's what the right says. What, is the, what did the copy leftists say about fair use? Oh. <laughs> I guess they would say the same thing. So who does like fair use? Oh, that would be judges, as well as conservative lawyers. Uh, judges ask a couple of questions. And they've asked these kind of questions since 1990. It's 1990 for a reason. A very smart judge named Pierre Laval wrote a very, very smart law review article that changed everything. They say, did you transform the use? And that's kind of a magical um, lawyer word. They mean, did you reuse it in a different way than its original market purpose? And did you use the appropriate amount to uh, satisfy that transformative use? That appropriate amount could be 100%. There was a recent lawsuit, the Bill Graham lawsuit, where uh, a book was created that created a total chronology of the uh, Grateful Dad's career. And um, they wanted to put in Fillmore posters from their early years. And, the, and Bill, Bill Graham said, no, not giving you the right to publish those posters. And they went ahead and published them anyway in their entirety, rather small, but in their entirety to demonstrate that they had been at the Fillmore and the, the Fillmore posters looked like that. And Bill Graham sued. Um, his lawyer was Bill Patry, by the way. And um, the Bill Graham case, Bill Patry, who's a famous lawyer and ended up being Google's lawyer, um, 
lost that case in such a humiliating way um, that that it's it's been he's become a convert to um, fair use ever since. And the the the, um, the judges in both the original and the appeal said, um, why is this case even coming to us? This is manifestly a fair use case. The thing that judges ask, and this is where I want to take you, the thing that judges ask implicitly, rarely explicitly, when they say, look, did you use it for some different purpose? And did you use the appropriate amount? They also say, what were your community's expectations? What do you do in your community that you need to use fair use like that? Can you tell us about that? What do people do here? Um, and they can't, they kind of can't answer those questions without knowing more or less what you do. L lawyer, uh, the judges will take that into account, uh, often implicitly, but they need to know that. So here's what people worry about with fair use. They say, will I guess wrong? Because you know, it's under some circumstances. The circumstances are basically when you, um, when your new use of creating new culture will be more valuable to the society than the cost to, to the private owner. Hmm, I wonder how I should make that calculation. Um, if I guess wrong, will I get sued? There are very, very stiff penalties and they're getting stiffer by the minute. Um, and this is something that the very large media stakeholders have been very interested in getting. They want them to be as scary as possible. But the most important issue for most people on a daily basis is the third question. I'm working within an institution, I'm working within a network, I'm working within a set of relationships that I need in order to sustain my work. Long before I would run the actual risk of getting sued, I do not want to make my boss upset. I'm working for a client. I don't want to get them angry. I, um, I'm, this, is, this is a student project. Will I get a bad grade? So these gatekeepers are probably the biggest fear. What can you do about that? How, in the absence of litigation, that, is, that there's very little litigation on fair use, what can you do to reduce the perceived level of risk and the actual level of risk to people who are facing a vague and abstract doctrine? You can create codes of best practices. Codes of best practices are a product of group deliberation in a community where the community says, you know, fair, I need to employ other people's copyrighted material without paying for it in some very routine ways here. Comes up all the time. I'm a teacher, I want to I wanna show copyrighted material in the classroom. I'm a student, I want to make a remix. I'm a, I'm a um, documentary filmmaker, I want to be able to critique a piece of media or use an example of it. Um, I'm, a, I'm an archivist and I want to be able to show an exhibit of material to which I do not own the copyright. What do I do? People deliberate together, and this is, this is where we've been helpful to people over the years since 2004. This is the American uh, University Fair Use Project that I've done with Peter Yassi. And um, I, I, can show you the, I can show you more of the website later, but there's nothing I'm going to mention here that is not on the website. Every code of best practices is, is there in HTML and PDF. There is, there is curriculum. There are short videos that are uh, illustrative and educational. Um, these are some of the communities that have defined fair use for themselves and have changed their practices. Documentary filmmakers, film scholars, media literacy teachers, and in January it will be academic and research librarians. This project started out with documentary filmmakers who were the guinea pigs. Um, the, the, we picked them first because I work with documentary filmmakers, I teach in a film program, and I had a high trust factor with them. We went to them and we said, what Tell us about a situation in the last few years where um, you had to make a creative decision and there were copyright questions involved. They told us a bunch of stories um, that, were, um, that had to do with other aspects of copyright. But here's what happened when they hit fair use. We'd say, you know, have you, have you had a situation where um, a project of yours got stalled or you couldn't complete something? because um, you just couldn't get rights clearance and you couldn't, um, you, you couldn't be comfortable about fair use. And they said, oh, no, that never happens. 
We are professionals. That would never happen to us. We don't stall projects in the middle. By the time people put money into it, oh no. Uh, and you say, really? You never, you always go forward with, with these works. How is it that you avoid these problems? And they say, well, you just avoid that material. You know, you, you don't, you don't uh, do anything with music because music is very, you know, it's very tough to clear lots of layers of rights. And don't get near um, movies. Popular movies, it's just impossible uh, to get the permissions. And, and then you have to deal with the union contracts. And, and really, we try to stay away from current events and politics because um, you have to deal with television and, and the anchors. Um, and we, we um, don't be funny. It's, it's not, um, you know, somebody might th not think that was parody, and then there you would be. And they, they, they would tell us this individually, and they would be very, you know, we, we added this up in pieces from people, and they all had different pieces of this story, but they were all sure they were making excellent sense. And when we took this information to them in a report, and we said, the most serious problem you have is self-censorship, they were shocked. And that was what motivated them to work together to create a code of best practices in documentary film. Now, the results were immediate, and long-lasting. Within eight weeks of the time that this, this code of best practices came out, it looks like this, and it's on our website, um, new films went to Sundance with, with uh, festival clearances. They were picked up by broadcasters. They, um, and within a year, you know, documentary filmmakers, in order to get their films on television and in theaters, require something called errors and omissions insurance. In case you made a mistake in, in any of your clearances, um, in, if you made a trademark violation, if, if you have a privacy case, any of these type of issues, your, your, your insurer is going to cover that for you. Insurers covered everything except fair use claims, and they hadn't for 20 years. Within a year of this coming out, all the insurers in America who cover e and it's only five, um, accepted fair use claims, and now they do so without incremental charges. The insurers of this country have decided that risk is so low, and by the way, what else are insurers interested in? I don't think so. Yeah, risk, that's it. The risk is so low that they, uh, they will insure worldwide um, for, for fair use claims that come in under this code. I will tell you, the whole time we made this code, documentary filmmakers were looking at us like, oh sure, like this is gonna make a difference. They were like, you know what? Our problem is the broadcasters, the lawyers, the insurers, we do it, but they won't let us. And we said, you know, once you have this document, you'll have something to tell them. And this document has indeed now completely changed the way that films are made. It has lowered clearance costs, it's lower friction, and it's improved the quality of the films. English teachers had the same experience. They were, they were sneaking films, they were sneaking at copies of advertisements that they they'd copied off their television into the classroom hoping that the librarian would never find out and show it in their classroom and hope that the students would never talk about it. So th th they had a lot of counterproductive, or, or they would just say, I only use the stuff that's in the library and the stuff that was in their media uh, media library would be 10 years old and the students had never even heard of it. So um, they were working, they were trying to teach analysis of current popular culture with no materials. Uh, this code made it possible for them to generate new curriculum, to ask for different kinds of assignments, and to get those assignments circulated. Until then, what, they, what was happening to, to them, even if they could get their students to make like a remix in class, the students, they would say, and let, let's show it on the uh, closed circuit television of school. And the principal would say, well, we can't do that because ed educational exemptions won't cover it once it leaves the four walls of the classroom. Now that they can actually teach their students correct copyright behavior, their students' work can be seen not only within the school, but it can go to YouTube and it can win national awards. Uh, it, this code has even been built into um, uh, school, uh, some school districts' copyright policies. Uh, online video, it's a set of, uh, is, is, um, is a set of, um, terms that help you understand, and it actually does some translation from old to new, from analog to digital, when fair use makes it possible for you to make a new work out of an existing one. So now we have remixers uh, saying proudly that they, uh, that they use fair use. Until this time, a lot of remixers wanted to share their work on the dark net, to bury it so that you couldn't find it, uh, smuggle it around to, to conferences on, on their own DVDs. Um, 
actually, when we finished this, uh, Google paid us $10,000 to make publicity materials and videos about it because they, they, they're in the middle of, they were in the middle of a lawsuit with Viacom and they couldn't, they couldn't actively endorse it, but they did want us to tell people about it. And it's, it's being used widely in after school programs. So this, this approach is spreading. We were very, very excited with the Open Courseware Initiative. And this is an example where getting beyond that copyright wars oppositionality thinking has made a huge difference. People who make open courseware need to be able to share professor's material with the world. Frequently, and I would say in almost all cases, professors are incorporating copyrighted material into their own curriculum. If a co professor is, includes a lot of that material and you can't include any of it, you're going to end up with a course that they call skeletons. That's what the open course work call, people call it. Because all that's left is, is what the professor was saying. So the professor says. And if you look at this, you can contrast it with, and you still know nothing. Uh, sometimes these courses are also called Swiss cheese courses because they, they have great big holes in them. Um, they finally, they were, they were not happy at the thought of, having to turn to fair use because they creative commons all of their work they truly wanted to be open and unencumbered to the world they finally came to the realization that if they did not in some way come to terms with copyright as it exists and use that fair use right they were going to be unable to serve their deeper mission so now what they've been able to do they created a code of best practices in fair use for open courseware mit in one year identified and uploaded 31 new courses that had been in cold storage because it had been, they had been kept out of the, they'd been skeletons. They uploaded 31 new courses and, and they're, they're everything from electrical engineering to music courses. Um, they are, these courses are able to be distributed and used on a consumer basis anywhere in the world. The difference between them and a work that is purely creative commons is that they can't uh, be disassembled and reused at will because the copyrighted material that does not belong to MIT or, or, or Stanford or one of the other uh, uh, universities still belongs to the original owner. It has been in one context correctly fair used. The person who reapplies it, who wants to use it in another context will have to make their own fair use decision or a decision according to the, um, the copyright laws of their own country. Uh, it's also been thrilling to see this, the, the, that this approach has had an impact on business. We've had archives tell us, this, this, this um, code is really good for me because now I can finally tell people who are trying to bully me um, into giving them a lower rate because they're threatening me with fair use that no, they can't fair use it. Because now it's clear what the limits are as well. Um, and so now we're going for librarians. And librarians are the, the most exciting, um, I don't want to be in any way diminishing the role and the importance of any of the other constituencies we've worked with, but librarians are the most exciting constituency we've worked with because you're everywhere. Because academic and research librarians are, are some of the most respected people in this country. And that when they provide both open educational resources and an active encouragement to use fair use rights, they are going to provide a way out from a polarizing discourse that is not hel helping. So fair use is indeed spreading. We've got a World's Fair Use Day uh, now uh, at, um, at um, Public Knowledge Organization. We have exciting projects experimenting with fair use. Critical Commons is a showcase for academics doing scholarship, employing fair use in their scholarship. Um, and uh, the New, New Media Literacies Project at uh, UC, uh, USC, University of Southern California, is also actively employing fair use. Um, there's a growing group of companies whose business models absolutely depend on fair use and that increasingly are providing in the business world and in the lobbying world a counterweight to the largest media companies. And it is unclear how all of that will play out, but it's going to be very interesting. We also have a wide group of nonprofits, including this institution, that clearly both need 
to have an expansion of copyright in terms of providing more into the public domain and also being able to employ the balancing features of copyright when they have to use copyrighted material that they haven't gotten approved. So here's the rhetoric I would like us to, to substitute for an oppositional and hostile copyright wars rhetoric. The copyright is about encouraging cultural creation. It's not about property rights. It's not about stealing anything from anybody, getting away with anything, or, or hoarding. Um, the key to successful uh, copyright is balance. Balance may need reform, but balance, I think, is ultimately where we're going for. One of the features that I think has been fascinating about the work I've done since 2004 is I don't meet very many people, including a lot of young people who are making media, who don't think that at some point their own copyright ownership rights won't be valuable to them. And that's, that is uh, something that really we have to take seriously. Uh, everybody who took a TwitPic, and the TwitPic was used by AP to illustrate a story, comes back and says, you know, you used that and you didn't pay me. So the fact that we have a social media environment that's circulating does not mean that people do not care about those rights. Uh, they increasingly are demonstrating that they do, but they have to be shown that they need to be invested in balance as well. So balancing features are in the public interest, and they're less well defended for obvious reasons than the copyright ownership interest. Not only are the copyright owners, there are a lot of big players there, but a lot of the copyright users, just to make a point that is obvious to every librarian, a lot of the copyright users haven't been born yet. A lot of the people who will use this material are in the future. They either haven't been born yet or they, they may be on this campus and they haven't thought about that yet. But they're not making a case for themselves that they need this stuff, so somebody needs to. Again, the importance of, of public institutions and, and libraries. So we do have the key tools for rebalancing if we want them. And I think that's a successful reframing of a conversation that has become deeply unproductive in other areas. So here are some areas in which it's possible to take that rhetoric and bring it into action. I think it's possible to build confidence in fair use. We're working from behind. Not only do we have unbalanced copyright, but there has been a lot of fear-mongering, both from the right and the left on this discussion. While the, while the business interests are busy saying, you know, any copying it constitutes downloading. There have been a lot of happy-go-lucky pranksters who, who, who are suggesting that all of copyright is crap. So we do, need to, we do need to build confidence in the fact that fair use is not just the right to hire a lawyer. It is a right that belongs to us. It's a free speech right. And guess what? It's not really any more difficult to exercise than your other free speech rights. It's just you're a lot more used to exercising your other free speech rights. Um, and we need, to, we need to make people aware. It's an educational project. It has been our experience, and something I really want to highlight for people, that people who understand what their rights are individually have the capacity to understand those rights politically as well. That is to say, they understand the political implications of having those rights. We were uh, surprised, as many of you probably know, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, although it does penalize people if you break encryption, even for legal purposes, has a clause in it that says every three years, if you really need to break encryption for your work, you can't make new culture without doing that, come to us, come to the Copyright Tribunal, tell us about it, and we'll consider giving you an exemption. In the last two rounds of the DMCA, People have shown up and gotten really great big exemptions. And the people who showed up were all people who had written codes of best practices. And we did not ask them to come. They came because they recognized what their rights mattered to them, how they mattered to their field, and they were now sensitized to the news that this was possible. What happened was that now all documentary filmmakers can break encryption in order to make their films. Every single person, this is something every teacher needs to know, every single person in the United States who is making a non-commercial video can break encryption to do that if they're employing their fair use rights. That's every, and then all higher ed teachers, 
um, and film and media students. And f at first it was just film scholars, and then the other scholars came like back into the copyright tribunal the next time, they're like, why, why are we chop liver? You know, like, I'm a biologist. I need to show a picture of a heart. Um, so they all, you know, they all want, now, um, now I'm waiting for the students to come back in. And I want the other, I want the other higher ed students to say, what? Just the film and media students? We make, we make media too. We need to break encryption. Um, that, that act of mobilizing to show up before the, the copyright tribunal to ask for a DMCA exemption is a political act. And you're winning when you win, not on behalf of you as a consumer or an, as, a, as an individual creator, but on behalf of a whole class of people. And a whole bunch of people did that because they understood their rights. So what I think happens is that you grow a constituency over time with this work, you grow a constituency for what ultimately have to be legislative reforms. We can do a lot. We can open bigger and bigger windows. We can rebalance in practice, but we still have an unbalanced copyright law. We still have a law that is deeply, deeply skewed toward existing owners and their legatees, their estates, otherwise known to many people as the greedy generation. Um, but creating that uh, constituency for legislative reforms and to resist more term extension, term extension is around the corner, by the way, be warned, um, is, is really important. And I don't think we can get there by fear. I think we have to get there by investing people in recognizing their rights, their abilities to contribute to an open environment, their, their, the, need to expand pro, uh, the, the need to expand the public domain material, and the ability to exercise the floating domain in the current world, which is fair use. Uh, I want to quote my co-PI um, co on this project. Uh, he always says, Flex, fair use is flexible, not unreliable. Um, and he also says, fair use is like a muscle. The more you use it, the bigger it gets. <laughs> Okay, so here are some opportunities I think scholars have. I think you can document problems that creators have, including your own colleagues. Um, you can research these rhetorical strategies that work. Um, I would love to see a um, sexier, snappier, more fun way to make people feel like owning their own rights was a good idea. Um, I would love to see people employ fair use, and uh, particularly to incorporate uh, the best of fair use into open educational resources so that they can be as rich as they can possibly be. Uh, and of course, to develop teaching modules, to develop curriculum, to develop uh, um, uh, assignments and tutorials that help people to understand these rights. Uh, I'm delighted to share this presentation. Uh, if you want to use it in its entirety, you can go ahead and do that. And if you want to use any part of it, please employ fair use. Thank you.